Welcome to the second half of the discussion on accessory structures. In this one, we're going to be focusing on the types of glands in the skin. So skin glands. There's three types. There's sebaceous glands, sweat glands, which are also known as sudoriferous, and ceruminous glands. All three are a little bit different, but they all appear as a dense coiled tangle of tubes deep in the dermis with a single tube that reaches the outer surface. So looking at sebaceous glands here, we can see that uh, they're producing sebum, which is our hair oil. So they're going to be attached most of the time to hair follicles. And the tubes deep within the dermis that we looked at in the previous slide are lined with epidermal cells, which is what we see right here. This is a holocrine gland. We can see as new epidermal cells reproduce, the older cells get moved into the inside of that tube where they're traveling outwards towards the hair follicle. Now, over the course of their travel, the cell themselves starts to break it down, releasing the sebum. So the sebum is ultimately the only thing that reaches the hair follicle. The two other types of glands, apocrine and merocrine, are similar. They have those tubes deep in the dermis, but they don't release entire cells like holocrine glands do. They have the epidermal cells. In this case, with apocrine, only a pinched off region of the cell itself goes into the tube, ultimately breaking down, releasing the contents. In the merocrine, none, uh, no part of the cell is released. The substance goes straight into the tubes. So holocrine, a little bit different. The entire cell is replaced. Not so much the case over here. We had previously spoken about glands having a coiled mass of tubes down uh, in the dermis with a single tube that extends from it. And sebaceous glands are no different. Um, but the, the coiled tubular region, um, as we can see in this picture, they are really close to the hair themselves. And since the coiled mass is close to the hair, the ductwork extending from the tube on sebaceous glands is short. The purpose of sebum is to keep hair soft, prevent against split ends, and uh, certain times of our life these glands can be overactive. Uh, recall they don't always attach directly to a hair, sometimes they go to the surface of the skin. And during uh, the years of puberty when our glands are out of control, uh, usually excess oil is produced, which is the result uh, in acne. So where can sebaceous glands be found? Pretty much anywhere on our body except for our palms and the soles of our feet. Um, some of these, as we know it, they attach directly to a hair follicle, but sometimes they open directly to the surface of the skin. Uh, a couple locations where they attach directly to the surface of the skin are in our lips and the corners of our mouths. So on your integument coloring sheet, I'd like you to find the sebaceous glands. It kind of looks like a cauliflower on our sheets. Uh, it's the letter D, color and label those, pausing the video while you do so. The second type of gland is our sweat glands, or our sudoriferous ones. Very widely spread throughout our, our body. We spoke of these um, secreting sweat as a result of a homeostatic mechanism to cool us down. These ones have the coiled mass deep down in our dermis with a single shaft extending to the surface of the skin. The opening at the surface of our skin, that is what we would call a skin pore. Sweat glands come in one of two varieties, ecrine or apocrine. Ecrine glands operate in the exact same fashion as merocrine, so no part of the cell is released into the ductwork of the gland. Uh, the sweat would go directly into it, which would then go to the surface of the skin. Um, apocrine glands, uh, the ones that are apocrine, Part of the cell itself is pinched off, which later disintegrates in the ductwork, releasing the sweat a little bit down the road. First off, we're going to look at ecrine glands. Um, they're found in different regions of the body as the apocrine ones, uh, and they're considerably more numerous. There's a lot more of them. These ones you could find in your forehead, your neck, or your back, and these are the ones that typically are used in response to increased temp body temperature for the cooling effects of homeostasis. Um, so these ones are, are quite active on hot days or also times of uh, increased physical activity. Once again, we can see the coiled tubular region down in the dermis with a single duct that extends upwards to the surface of the skin with a pore at the top. 
The apocrine sweat glands are found in the axillary regions, which we call as our armpits, our groin, and around the nipples. Uh, these glands become uh, considerably more active during puberty, um, and usually these are the ones that start to, to start to produce sweat when we get upset or we're frightened, uh, in pain. And they also do um, when we're exercising too, don't get me wrong here. Um, but the location ultimately is, is the difference between the apocrine and the ecrine. Um, once the sweat reaches the surface of the skin, because we're uh, talking different regions of our body with armpits and, and groins and whatnot, and there's, there's hair there, uh, there's bacteria that tend to reside in those areas of our body, um, hence the, the smell that, that is created when we're sweating. Uh, the sweat has salts in it that the bacteria can kind of feed off of, um, and as they do so, that creates a, that, that creates a smell. Uh, so that's ultimately why we begin to smell a little bit from our armpits uh, as we exercise. It's because the bacteria there use that sweat for, for energy. So here we can see a couple um, differences between the ecrine and apocrine. Uh, the ecrine coiled mass in the dermis extends up through a pore in the skin used for cooling purposes. The apocrine, once again, in our armpits and our groins, uh, same thing, coiled mass in the dermis, but in this case, uh, the tube leads to a hair shaft because that's, there's a lot of hair in our arms and whatnot. Um, that is metabolized by bacteria in those regions, creating uh, the smell. Uh, so on your coloring sheet, please label in color uh, E, E1, and E2. Uh, pausing the video while you do so. And lastly, our ceruminous glands. Uh, ceruminous glands produce a, a product called cerumen, hence the name ceruminous. Uh, they're found in two different locations, one being in the ear, the second in the mammary glands of the breast. Uh, the ones in our ear secrete earwax, which is known as cerumen, and these are active our entire life. Uh, earwax, it's really sticky, it's tacky. Uh, that's to trap um, uh, uh, particles in the air uh, from getting deeper into our eardrum, causing potential infection. Uh, so you really don't want to remove your earwax. I know a lot of people use Q-tips and whatnot. I'm guilty myself. Um, but it's there for a purpose, and by consistently removing the earwax, we're making ourselves more susceptible to those infections. Now in the mammary glands, the uh, ceruminous glands secrete uh, breast milk. Um, so they're not always active um, in a female's lifetime. It's more or less during uh, the recent months directly after giving birth when, when they're uh, active. Other than that, they're not active, but they are there. We can see some tissue from a ceruminous gland uh, down in here. They're kind of uh, appear as, as holes. Um, that's because they can store things that is later secreted. This concludes our second discussion over the accessory structures.